and I worked in Canadian radio for a little while after I graduated, and then I went to work for Clear Channel um, when I was a, uh, well, you know, when I had graduated. And as I started in the commercial radio industry in the United States, uh, the 1996 Telecommunications Act was being implemented. And although my original goal was just to develop some additional skills to stay in the radio industry, I kind of decided that I liked doing media policy. And uh, I went back to school and got my master's degree at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And then from there, um, I got convinced to join the PhD program at UW-Madison. And uh, I've been doing journalism and mass communication work ever since. We've already been talking in this class about the Snapchat cheerleader case in the article you and your students wrote about. Could you give us a brief summary of what made that case so interesting? Well, I think what's interesting about that case is that it's a student media case, and we don't see all that many cases involving student speech. Um, the thing that takes it to the next uh, part of it being interesting is it involves social media which is, you know, frankly, the logically next, uh, next battleground for student expression. By student expression, I mean high school, public high school students in the United States who have some First Amendment rights, but those First Amendment rights can be curtailed depending on how those words or choices make school administrators look like as a result of decisions that are rather old at this point. The last time the Supreme Court had spoken on student speech was the Morse v. Frederick, which is the bong hits for Jesus case from Alaska. So this case was interesting, A, because it's First Amendment case, but also because it involves student speech and student speech on social media. Were you at all surprised that the Supreme Court took that case? I didn't think it was an incredibly novel case, um, and I thought the appellate decision was correct. So I guess I was a little surprised. Um, I think I was less surprised by the outcome of the case in that the cheerleader, uh, her name is Levy, was uh, essentially had, the court essentially declared that she had her rights violated. I think the danger in the current Supreme Court or the current, the court as it was construed at the time the case was granted cert is that there are several people on the several justices on the Supreme Court who are wrestling with how to handle social media and the article that you just flashed up there is is sort of our wrestling with not just the student speech issue in the case which I think got a lot of attention but sort of the underlying arguments that are sort of revolving around how we handle internet speech and I think in, you know, by one metric, the metric that most people looked at the case, the social media, or the at least the student speech angle, the student speech uh, issue was pretty straightforward. They shouldn't have punished her for it. It was off campus activity. You know, we can go into the, the, the nitty gritty if you'd like, but I think the larger interest and certainly larger interest I had in it as somebody who studies media policy is how we handle the internet speech issues that the case raises. And frankly, I'm terrified by what the case means at that scale. I think a lot of people had a sort of a short-sighted view of how the decision worked and didn't really appreciate how expansive the court granted schools to have the power to regulate student speech on social media platforms. So, yeah, let's dig into that a little bit. Uh, we, you know, we had the Tinker case out of Iowa uh, as kind of a foundation and then high school journalism cases after that. What's been happening as the court changes and shifts its composition and its thoughts about um, how, how broad um, these kinds of restrictions can or should be? Sure. The the reality is, is that ever since Tinker, which gave students a fair amount of speech rights, the courts have narrowed the ground on which those rights can be uh, can be uh, allowed to occur. Uh, we saw that first with the Hazelwood case, right, that the court sort of said, well, yes, yeah, students have speech rights unless it makes the school look bad. And then in Morris v. Frederick, um, where the school 
the activity that offended the school's sort of speech standard didn't even occur on school grounds. The court sort of expanded that magic schoolhouse gate from Tinker, you know, to across the street where the activity actually occurred. And it wasn't surprising to me, disappointing perhaps, but not surprising to me that the court extended that sort of magic schoolhouse gate to encompass student speech that occurs basically anywhere on the internet. Tinker gets a lot of credit, but I think Hazelwood is the key case when we look backwards now in that the limits on student speech often have a lot to do not with limiting student speech, but limiting the potential reputational damage of the schools to which the students belong. And that certainly was one of the underlying issues in the Levy case. The school didn't like what she had to say, but they were afraid of how it made the school look. And frankly, that's the that's Hazelwood and not Tinker per se. I've often wondered about high school administrators really since the 1970s when I was in high school and we had a principal who uh, basically stopped publication of the school newspaper over a story that he thought went went too far um, and might might offend somebody. What is it about, uh, you know, you would think public schools would be the environment uh, that would come closest to that sort of robust public speech as young people are becoming adults. Well, one would hope that would be the case, but frankly, it's not been the case. Um, I was in high school in the late 80s and early 90s, and we had an incident at my high school where a student actually overdosed on drugs uh, during the school day, and they kept us after that day to convince us that he had only had some sort of medical condition, right? I mean, they, and people had seen the activity that led to the situation in question. And everybody, of course, being high school, everybody knew about it within five or 10 minutes. So when they straight up lied to us about it, it was, you know, it was strictly to make the reputation of the, you know, to protect the reputation of the school rather than sort of allowing kids to deal with it. I don't know. I'm, I'm sometimes considered a bit of an extremist when it comes to First Amendment defense and protections for speech. But I don't think that you do kids a favor, public or private, if you keep them from speech. It's just speech, right? And it's protected in the United States. And I, I think telling kids that their opinions are offensive to people, okay, fine. But that it makes the school look bad is the, about the worst possible reason to prevent them from engaging in speech activity. Are, are you more of a, an absolutist on speech in the way that Justice Douglas was, or are you, what would you do with, with action or symbolic speech that isn't pure speech? I don't know. It, uh, everything's a situational dependent situation, but I'm starting from, I'm always starting from the idea that more speech is better and that unless it meets one of the criteria for limited speech, one of the six unprotected categories, or one of the categories of speech like broadcasting or advertising, where you know there are some narrowing controls on it, it should be protected. And in a public school of all places, we should be able to express ideas. You know, I I buy into the tinker disruption standard, or at least its intent, but I don't think that that is an excuse to prevent students from engaged in, in expressive activity, certainly. In terms of the broader internet and the implications going forward after Reno versus ACLU, and I think you also reference um, some other law here, packing, the Packingham case, of course, um, that, that sort of speak to the, the social political significance of speech. Um, are we still at a point where the court will defend kind of core political speech as, as, as generally being protected or, or are you worried about erosion there as well? I'm, well, I'm constantly worried about erosion just as a general rule, not any specific makeup of the court or at any time, I'm always worried about erosion. I think the thing that people don't understand about the internet is that the key decision that defended speech on it and creates the speech environment that the internet lives under was made in 1997, which in internet terms is frankly just a different era. The, the, the court, when it looked at the internet in 1997, it was trying to decide if it was television, 
or if it was a newspaper and the internet looked far more like a newspaper in 1997 than it did like a television station. And that decision is the only decision in which the court has ever really said that the internet's strict scrutiny applies. Um, the court, as it has moved more conservative in my lifetime, um, certainly seems tied to the idea of protecting lots of speech. But if you look at it a little closer, it's very much tied to speech that conservatives like. And that's what Citizens United and the line of cases that follows on the political advertising side have done. It would, it's not outside their own possibility, and this is the argument that we make in the article, uh, that the Mahananoi decision is actually sort of a, a flag that people should start paying attention to, that Reno was made in 1997 and the situation has changed and the decision is very clear. O'Connor's opinion in the decision is very clear that you know this is how we understand this now. We may need to revisit this at some time. And if the internet were to be moved under some sort of regulatory scheme that looks more like broadcasting, for example, it would fundamentally alter how political speech is delivered in this country. And I would be among the first people to object to that, certainly. And there certainly are calls in Congress to uh, repeal Section 230 that has given uh, these sites, uh, uh, ISPs as well, this kind of immunity. Uh, is the political landscape shifting in a way that really does threaten um, Internet speech in the U.S. and the fact that the Internet crosses boundaries, uh, does that also increasingly become a problem as it becomes more global? Well, I think one of the significant issues that is occurring is that in other countries that aren't protect, where speech is not protected by a First Amendment, there are increasingly controls on the types of speech that can occur online. Um, Europe being the examples A, B, and C in many cases, that you have things like the Network Enforcement Act in Germany, you have things in the EU where certain types of speech are just not allowed to occur, which are, you know, you may disagree with it, but it's core political speech at its at the definition of what is core political speech. I think the imminent danger to something like that happening in the United States is you have at least three justices who voice some interest in revisiting the debate over Section 230, but also things like compelled speech and uh, access issues that Reno prevents from occurring that occur for other forms of media broadcasting and cable being the number one, number two examples. And I think that the desire to sort of equalize the differences between these different, different forms of electronic media certainly puts some pressure if the right case were to come up for them to alter Reno's holding in some way that sort of changes the dynamic of how internet speech is allowed to occur. Right now, it's sort of this wild west on how it happens it wouldn't be very hard to imagine them trying to put some kind of constraints on that, much as they did for broadcasters 70 years ago and cable 50 years ago. It's interesting, too, because we have the, you know, the, the free speech rights of individuals, but then we also have companies like Twitter, Meta, Facebook, Instagram, where um, we're, you know, we've got at the state level now in Texas, I believe Florida also, there are statutes under review that would try to check their powers to, for example, ban uh, Donald Trump from Twitter and his 80 million followers that he had at the time. Yeah, a lot of those bills are uh, sort of what was dealt with in Tornillo and Red Lion in many ways for broadcasting and newspapers, and that most of those bills compel social media platforms to carry content that they might otherwise choose not to carry. Um, the Florida bill, for example, requires you to basically carry any political speech regardless of its source with significant sanctions for failing to do so. Well, social media platforms are not state actors. They're private entities. And just as I can kick any, anybody who's rude out of my house, social media platforms have the right, because they aren't state actors, to do the same with anyone they choose for any reason, discriminatory or otherwise. Um, you know, they can let one conservative talk and kick the other 10 conservatives out and they can let 10 Democrats kick, 
talk and not kick anybody out is it's their choice it's their house but the the bills that are on the books and the two notable ones are the texas and the florida one both of which are tied up in court right now um what those bills do is they force social media platforms to be sort of open access and open forums without them being state actors or public property and we don't really have case law that defends that so far but it, again it's reno that the Reno decision, which prevents us from implementing rules like those. And, you know, if Reno goes away and the Supreme, this Supreme Court has demonstrated its somewhat questionable commitment to longstanding precedent, um, if, you know, Reno were to go away, laws like that could be passed at the state level and then social media platforms would have to find ways to comply with them um, at the intra state level. And left unanswered, and, and this has been the case for a long time, is is what exactly constitutes a public forum. Going back to the Prune Yard shopping mall, right. you know, the, are, are there any circumstances in which a private space becomes a public sphere essentially because of its nature or context? Well, I mean, that's certainly the push um, to you know, get some sort of declaratory ruling that, you know, these are functionally public forums, sort of the quasi public forum law that exists uh, in terms of precedent. And then, you know, sort of force them open in ways that were done for places like shopping malls, is the great example, um, you know, a generation ago. I, I'm somewhat skeptical that those laws can stand as long as Reno's on the books, but inevitably one law like that is going to make it up to to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, as it's currently construed, has already voiced some interest in maybe revisiting some of these elements and whether or not they should be uh, platforms. I mean, the only reason we didn't have the case already is it was sort of declared moot when Trump was uh, lost the election. And, you know, the case law that was pending at the time that was going to go up, the Knight case, um, you know, was they just they sort of didn't deal with it. The court didn't deal with it in any meaningful way. But, you know, those are there's going to be a case that comes up that the court's going to have to deal with. And the circuit split you're likely to have between the 11th and the 5th in these compelled speech social media cases are certainly going to be a vehicle for being concerned what the court will do in terms of forcing social media open. You've also researched, uh, looked at uh, the, the special case of the broadcast context, which um, you, know, you mentioned the Red Lion decision uh, and compared it to Tornillo, the newspaper decision of a right of reply statute. Um, broadcasters over the air continue to be licensed to serve the public interest, convenience and necessity. And that certainly makes them, them different from other forms of, of media. Uh, I thought, I, I believe it was Justice Alito in one of the uh, broadcast indecency cases who seem to suggest maybe it was that oral arguments that if we just wait it long enough, we wouldn't have to deal with broadcasting because everything is shifting toward the digital spaces. Do you have any sense of, of, of broadcasters have long said through RT and DA and other organizations that we're second class citizens when it comes to the First Amendment. Do you have any sense that uh, we're ready to sort of dispel that, that division? Well, as I, I tell my media study students regularly uh, in the intro, to cl intro class, a lot of our media system exists for the simple reason, this is how we've always done things and we don't like to change how we've done things. Broadcasting is the classic example of this, right? There's a lot of things about the broadcasting industry that exist only because that's how we've done things. The six and 10 o'clock news, for example, that's how we've always done things, right? There's very little innovation in that industry and an industry that is, is you know, sort of dying as it, as it goes. But 120 million people watch broadcast television every week in this country. It's not going away anytime soon. I think Alito's larger point was, is that old style broadcast regulation and broadcasters do have a point that in terms of the First Amendment, they actually have the, among the most narrow rights because the federal government can make them do things. They can make them say things. They 
can compel speech, kid TV, political advertising rules, et cetera. Um, but they can also restrict things in terms of indecency and uh, obscenity that occur in broadcasting. Um, of course, the the counter to those things is the FCC does not enforce those rules very stringently anymore. The indecency rules are basically a joke at this point. And in terms of things like red line and the fairness doctrine and the political, the personal attack rule, which was behind that case, you know, the FCC hasn't enforced many of those rules for 30 or 40 years now. And yes, they're interesting as historical legacies and they're important in first amendment doctrine terms, 